Good morning once again. It's a delight to see you this lovely day. Glad you made your way over here to be a part of this this message and a part of this time of worship. And um, of course, it goes without saying, we pray that the Lord will speak clearly uh, to each and every one of us. If we're in Ephesians 6, we're going to read once again 13 through 17. This is our passage of scripture. And this morning, we're going to speak about the sword of the Spirit. So the Word of God says this to us here in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Father, do bless us and do speak to us this morning from this very rich and very meaningful passage of Scripture. I ask you in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This is our final message on the armor of God, and it's a good time to remind you once again that we are in a war. We have been given the armor of God, also known, using the Greek word, the panoply of God, to be able to stand and to be able to withstand. Charles Spurgeon said, it is not enough that you are not conquered. You have to conquer. And hence we find that we are to take not only a helmet to protect the head, but also a sword with which to annoy the foe. Now I really kind of like that word annoy right there. You know, it's just fun to pester the devil and to remind him of his end, and to remind him of his destiny, and to remind him who won, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we gather. That's one of the things we do. So God speaks to us today, and God tells us today to take the sword. You have no other weapon in this battle that you can presently see there is no spear. There's no sling to hurl rocks at your Goliath. But there's a sword, a mighty sword. And you were told, take the sword. Now let me explain to you, and I will repeat myself later. When you look at the sword, there are two swords that are generally mentioned in Scripture. One of them is a rather short instrument. It was culturally defined in the sense that in some parts, what you're looking at on the screen is known as the gladius. Think gladiator. And that's the short sword that you would often see in their hands. That was a common Roman sword. Sometimes it had more of a curvature to it, especially the swords that came out of Greece and, and later, as you saw, evolve in time, came out of the Middle East. Those also were short swords. And then there are the long swords, the long swords. In Scripture, it's the short sword that's mentioned here. In other places, it's the long sword. And we'll bring that back uh, in remembrance in just a, fall, a few minutes. This, ladies and gentlemen, we speak of when we say take the sword, is the sword of the Spirit. We sometimes say that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he is. He's a soft wind, very often. 
He's a whisper. He's a gentle breeze that barely moves the air around you. But he also has a sword. And when he unsheathes his sword, beware. There is no sword like the sword of the Spirit. And I want to show you three truths based on that this morning. That the sword of the Spirit is the promises of God, operates in the power of God, and results in the peace of God. These three things we'll learn as we go through, beginning with the promises of God. This is the sword of the Spirit, the promises of God. You know, sometimes when you see the phrase, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, sometimes when you see the phrase, the Word of God, it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, a passage we're all uh, most all of us, I believe, are very familiar with. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And then later, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, and truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at those words, the Word of God speaks of Him, the Lord Jesus. And in that passage, we learn that the Word lives and the Word speaks. And we learn that the Logos, which is what word is used there, is the Creator. And the Logos is God. And the Logos is God incarnate. We see that all through uh, John where he speaks. Sometimes when you see the Word of God, it speaks about the Bible. You know this passage well, but in Hebrews chapter 4, the Word of God tells us this in verse 12. Something you're very familiar with, many of you are, that is. For the Word of God, there it is again, by the way, logos. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. There we have the word for the long sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We speak of Lagos as the living word, the Lord Jesus, but also is the written word, the infallible, inerrant word of God. But let me tell you something, when it's spoken, when God's spoken word or written word uh, uh, it, it confronts us, it transcends the regular words of, of our thoughts. It is sharp. It cuts. It divides. It discerns. The spoken or written word being a long sword has a long reach. It's not a beautiful sword. Sometimes it's a bloody sword. No surgeon operates without releasing blood, ladies and gentlemen. And the Word of God pursues us and cuts us until we finally yield and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes you see the words the Word of God, and it speaks about a personal message that God has shown you in your heart. That message might be the promise of God or promises of God. I'm telling you, I've mentioned it to you before, I picked up a book, 100 Promises of God. I went back a year later and it was 365 Promises of God. Another time I went back to the same bookstore and it was 700 Promises of God. And then I've got a book, a book upstairs, all the promises of God. They just kind of ran out. And they just said, all the promises of God, written by Herbert Lockyer years and years and years ago.
why we have so many precious promises that God has given to us. Peter said, we have exceedingly precious promises. That's what it is. And God gives us those promises and he uses them in our heart. That's why we used to sing standing on the promises of God Why we did that. Well, that message may be prophetic in nature. You know, sometimes when God speaks to us on a personal level, what he does with us is he speaks a word directly into our heart, and it's a prophetic word. Now, now I'm not talking about fortune-telling here. I'm not talking about foretelling when I speak about that. Um, I'm talking about what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. When you listen to the Holy Spirit, John 16 says that he will convict. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's what prophecy will do. It convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what he does every time. And the Holy Spirit will do that in our hearts as well when we're reading it. Every time it is personal. When it is the rema, and that's the word here, rema of God. This is the short sword, the one for personal combat, the one by which you stand against the enemy when he attacks you. And believe me, if you're not being attacked right now, you live for Jesus, I promise you he's going to do it. The sword of the Spirit is the promises of God. The sword of the Spirit operates in the power of God. This is something that's, that's comforting for me and refreshing. He operates in the power of God in our temptations. Let me tell you something. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not. And every one of us is going to be tempted. But please let me remind you, God never tempts us to do evil. The Lord doesn't ever tempt us to do evil. And I've heard people come to me and, and, and the things that they told me that God told them to do completely contradicted the word of God and contradicted the standards of God. God never tempts us to do evil. So don't come saying something to me that contradicts the word of God. I'm going to point out to you it does contradict the word of God and because God never tempts us to do something that's, that's contrary to his word. Never. Never does that, and not one time. The Satan is the tempter, ladies and gentlemen. Satan is the tempter. Let me show you. Look, look over at James 1 for a moment, please. I could just read it to you, but I think you need to have a, a, a moment to use your fingers and <clears throat> turn your pages over to James 1. And we're going to look at a couple of verses here. We'll start at verse 13. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll begin there, and I want to show you some verses of Scripture. Verse 13, James chapter 1, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Watch this, verse 14, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The Bible many times calls Satan the tempter, and he tempts us at our weak points. And his temptations are snares and hooks. This is the picture that you have where it talks about we are enticed, we're drawn away. They, they, he does that in our lives. Satan's temptations are intended to trap you. And you won't easily see them. If you could see it, it's not a trap. You can recognize the potential of the trap. Because your fleshly desires will be aroused with what you see or what you taste or what you touch. These things will be enticing to you. That's how Satan tempts us with these things. 
Let me ask you, what snare, what hooks has Satan's demons set in front of you? Is it a man or a woman who says your spouse does not understand you? No one understands you. Is it happiness or laughter from those who have compromised with the world but do not seem to suffer comfort from the consequences? Is it an old appetite that keeps rising to the surface no matter how often you push it down? You get alone, things are quiet, and that appetite rises once more, and that temptation comes with it. No one sees you. No one is watching. No one hears you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Satan tempts us, ladies and gentlemen, in three general categories. The Word of God tells us in 1 John 2, beginning in verse 15, if you need to read along with me, I would suggest you do so. Three different categories. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And there we see Eve tempted in these areas. Satan set a trap for her. And he got her to doubt God's goodness. And he made her feel deprived of something greater than she already had. And Satan showed her a desirable alternative to God's plan. And Eve stepped right into Satan's snare. Now, old Adam, we men are so dumb sometimes. Old Adam... He just did it. He just rebelled willfully. Jesus was tempted in these areas. The bread, the large pinnacle at the temple, the high mountain where he saw all the kingdoms of the world in one glance, all of these were there, beginning with doubt. If you're the Son of God, turn this, these stones into bread. With desire, with deprivation, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all of these were there when Jesus Christ was tempted. Thank God he was shown victorious over these temptations. But the sword of the Spirit, that's the power of God in your temptations. That's when God shows you his strength. And when Jesus was tempted, he said, it's written... He pulled out that sword. Man shall not live by bread alone. He pulled it right on out and began slicing away. 
It's written, do not tempt the Lord your God. What power. Then is the power of God in your trials. You know, it might be a call about your health. I have a friend who waited five long days, six days, excuse me. Six long days after having some tests run. And they had told him, we're not sure what these tests are going to show. And one day passed, and don't you hate that? When they just put it off like that, and another day, and yet another day, and finally they called him up, and he sent me a text message and said, victory, victory, there is no cancer. Man. But he might have gotten the other. Or it could be like a phone call I received last week. One of my friends and I had gone for lunch, I believe, on Thursday, and we were seated together over uh, at Mario's. If you've been there, if you haven't been there yet, you need to go. A good Italian place. And, and we were eating there, and this friend of mine called me up, and he says, I need you to pray now. I need you to stop, and I need you to pray. Well, I called him back and said, tell me what's going on. And he told me about his firstborn son who promised his mother that very moment that he was going to commit some kind of sin that would surely send them to hell. My friend has prayed for his son and pled with his son and pointed his son to the cross over and over and over again. And I said, Lord, you, you're the only one that can bring comfort to his heart. I, I called him, or he called me back on the phone to tell me, give me a good report from this. But I said, I need your permission to share this. He said, please do. Please share it. I prayed that God would give him that word, that promise, that comfort that only the Word of God can give, that short sword, the Rema, that God would give us in that time. And that's what has carried him through. Might be a knock on your door one day, the specter of death standing by your visitor, giving you bad news. We listened to one of our friends recently, Pam and I did, who told us about the trial of losing a son. How hard that would be. It could be like Angus Abraham Fung. You hear about that man? You know that name? Or maybe it's Fung. I don't know. Let me tell you about Angus. He was a Wycliffe Bible translator. And he and his wife were in the midst of a, an area translating scripture when Fulani tribesmen came by a week ago today and they dragged him out of the house and they hacked him to death and they cut off his wife's arm. And Mrs. Fung is going to live with this. But I tell you, the word of God is power. And she'll need that word. She'll need the sword of the Spirit in the days to come. But let me tell you about the power of God. It's, it's in these areas, but it's the power of God in your triumph because when the logos, the written word, becomes the rema, this promise of God, it cuts through temptations like hot butter. And when the logos becomes the rema, the blows of the whip, these trials that I spoke of, the rod of those trials become more endurable until the end of the trial. Now, there's Paul in Corinth when Corinth was his, uh, first on his radar, and he was there in Corinth, and, and uh, the Lord said to him, you know, don't be afraid to preach here. I got a lot of folks in this city. Don't be afraid to preach here. Then he left, and he wrote them later, and he said to them later in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I love these words, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Isn't that great what God says and promises to us? He gives us power and he gives us comfort when even in the midst of trials we face these things. I have one last thing I'm going to share with you. And it's my conclusion to you. Because when you take the sword of the Spirit, and folks, you have to take it. That's an imperative verb. You have to reach out, the Greek word echo, and you have to take that sword in your hand. It has to be something you receive personally in that moment. When you take it, it results in the peace of God. That's what it does. Now, you may not have the peace of God until the Holy Spirit performs surgery on your soul and your spirit with that long sword, the Lagos. But when you triumph over temptation, when you triumph over the call of the world around you, because you used your short sword, the Rema, God's peace overwhelms you. When you face a trial, when things are looking chaotic around you, and you go into the Word, and as it were, the Holy Spirit taps you on your shoulder and said, read this again. The peace of God that passes all understanding encompasses you in that moment and overwhelms you in the midst of the trial. Preacher went to a house to comfort a lady whose sons, plural, had just died. And he said, how am I going to do this? And he showed up at the door and knocked on the door and the lady of the house showed up, a widow lady. And she said, come on in, pastor. How's your day going? And he looked at her. He says, but sister, you just got this news. She said, yeah, yeah I did. But I also heard from God. And who's going to wonder about the ways of God? I'm not going to question him in this moment. And that pastor said, well, I learned an awful lot about God on that day. I'm telling you, he'll take the sword and he will use it to slay those enemies that come against you. Father, thank you for your word. It's a true word. It's a good word, it's righteous. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that the word, the Lagos, becomes the Rema, that you speak to us through the word of God. And I pray you would speak now, the Holy Spirit would speak to the hearts of men and women. And this morning, if you need Christ Jesus, He's more than able to save you. And you can call on his name and turn from your sin. And my Lord Jesus is there ready to receive you. This morning, if God spoken to you and he said to you, this is your place to serve, you may want to transfer your membership. But maybe he spoke a word of comfort to your heart, a word of victory to your heart through this message. You may want to come and just give thanks here on these steps. Father, you take this invitation. Use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.